let's go ahead and discuss the normal or otherwise known as Gaussian distribution. And as you can see here, that is represented by this bell-shaped curve. It's equal on both sides. And in the middle, you have the mean, which is denoted by the Greek letter mu. So as we sweep through this distribution, notice how on both sides, 68% of the data is situated within plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean. And standard deviation refers to dispersion. How far away is this data from the middle, from the mean? As we move further out, notice how 95% of the data is situated within plus or minus two standard deviations from the mean. And lastly, how 99.7% of the data is situated within plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean. And this is also referred to as the 68, 95, 99.7% rule for normal distributions. So from the normal distribution, we can derive a significance level alpha, and that is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. But before we get into that, let's establish an example hypothesis testing framework. So if we have a company with cash flow in Q4 and Q3, when you subtract the two, it's zero. There's no change. That's your baseline. That's your null hypothesis. There's no difference in cash flow. Alternatively, we can say that when looking at the difference between cash flow in Q3 and Q4, it's greater than zero, so there is a change, and we could say that, that the company is operating at a cash flow positive rate. Now, there are a few important rules to establish in this hypothesis testing framework. For example, in the null, you can only have symbols of equality, like so. Now, the greater than or equal to or less than or equal to symbols those symbols of inequality are okay to use in the null hypothesis as exceptions. However, in the alternative, you can only have symbols of inequality, like so. Now, from this normal distribution, if we look at the 99% confidence interval, to establish alpha, we simply take that 99%, subtract it from 100, and we get 1%. So your alpha is based on that confidence level. For the 95% confidence level, we do the same. We take 95%, subtract it from 100. We have 5% significance level. Now, in order to establish whether or not we're going to reject the null hypothesis, we're only looking to the null to decide, are we going to reject the null or fail to reject the null? We can never say we accept the null, that is an improper statement, so we can only reject it or fail to reject it. And if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha, then we reject the null. And if the p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, then we fail to reject the null. So we examine the normal distribution and establish the hypothesis testing framework such that one ties into the other, and in so doing, we learned that when setting up an experiment, it is crucial to have this hypothesis testing framework such that you can examine uh, relationships between significance levels. However, for a more practical use case, let's just say to establish a confidence interval, we're going to look at a company by the name of Starving Burgers, which sells do-it-yourself burger kits on a monthly basis continuity program. Subscribers pay $20 a month to receive burger kits complete with buns, packaged American cheese, and a variety of meats or veggies. However, in recent months, the company's CFO has become quite concerned with the downward trending trajectory of Starving Burger's revenue. So he's tasked his marketing team with launching two separate and distinct campaigns simultaneously for different burger kits and ultimately figuring out which product performs best by estimating its sales. The first campaign is launched in the traditional manner, burger kits covered in tin foil and wrapped into a plastic bag. The second campaign takes the same original burger kits, but contains logos on stickers affixed to the foil and the kits are placed into a nice box with the logo as well. The average daily sales have been 1000 units across 11 channels. And with the second campaign, the same number of units across 28 marketing channels. The standard deviation for each of these is 16. 
So the CFO is interested in figuring out um, with a 95% confidence interval, how many units are slated to sell for each campaign. So what do we not know? We don't yet have the standard error, but we can go ahead and figure that out. And we're trying to figure out what the 95% confidence interval is. And that is the goal of this exercise. So we can go ahead and calculate the standard error of X bar by looking at the standard deviation and dividing it by the square root of the sample size N. We have our standard deviation as 16, but we have two ends, the first one being 11. So if we were to look at this first example, we take 16 divided by the square root of 11, and that gives us roughly 4.82 as our standard error of X bar. We further use that to calculate the 95% confidence interval by taking this X bar of 1,000 daily sales units on average, plus or minus two times the standard error of X, and we already have all of these values. But before we calculate this, notice how this two times the standard error is tied to the normal distribution. And these two standard deviations on both sides are directly tied to this 95% confidence interval. And that is our Z-score. Typically, the Z-score is 1.96. That's the official number, but we round it to two for the purposes of this seamless illustration. To calculate this out, we take 1,000, which is our X bar, minus, again, remember, because this is plus or minus, two times the standard error. That's our first lower bound, comma, the upper bound, 1,000 plus two times the standard error. And that gives us our confidence interval. We're gonna go ahead and break this down further in practice. So let's go ahead and do the same thing in Excel. I think it'd be a lot easier to, um, to somewhat automate this process. So X bar is again given to us as 1,000 units. And um, for the first marketing campaign is 11 and the standard deviation 16. So to get the standard error, we take, let's look at this formula, cell B3, and notice how it's locked in at B3 because we don't want it to change, and B3 is 16. So we take cell B3 and divide that by the square root of B2. And again, we lock in with the dollar sign cell B2 because we don't want this to change. Uh, these values are in position and in place and they're not going anywhere. So now with this formula, we have the um, standard error calculated as roughly 4.82. And again, to get the uh, lower bound of the 95% confidence level, we take cell B1, which is the average 1000 units, minus, remember minus because it's on the lower bound, two, because that's tied to confidence level of 95% multiplied by cell B5, which is our standard error. When we calculate this out, we get our lower bound of roughly 990. And the same thing goes for our upper bound, except for uh, we have a plus instead of a minus in the middle. Now, it's important to lock these values in because if you don't, then things are just going to move around on you and these cells are going to change. And again, we're not moving anything. We're just simply changing what um, goes inside the function, for example, plus or minus. So when we uh, calculate this value in cell C7 for the upper bound, for this 95% confidence level, we get roughly 1,010 units. So this is the confidence interval that the CFO was looking to calculate for this first marketing campaign of um, 11 units. Now, if we change this to 28 units, and the beauty of Excel is that you don't have to constantly redo everything. You can just change certain parameters and the formulas are still tied to them. And now you have with a 95% confidence interval for these 28 units sold in the second marketing campaign, a lower bound of 994 and an upper bound of roughly 1006. But let's also say that we wanted to calculate the 68% confidence interval. We can take this uh, formula in cell B7, drag it down, and just change the parameters. So what do we have again in cell B1? That's not going to change. That's 1,000 units right here. 
And then and everything else will stay the same except for this two, because recall from the normal distribution that the 68% confidence interval is based on how many standard deviations from the mean, one. So that's all that's gonna change here. So we're gonna replace this with one. We're gonna drag this down and replace this with one. So this is our 68% confidence level. And to calculate the 99% confidence level, Remember that this is the same formula again, except for how many standard deviations is 99% away from the mean? Three. So we'll go ahead and replace this one with the three on both sides. And that gives us our 99% confidence interval of uh, between 991 and 1009. So this is how we calculate confidence intervals in Excel, given the um, average, the sample size, and the standard deviation. And from these values, we can proceed to derive the standard error with the formula of standard deviation over the square root of the sample size. And from that, we can calculate various confidence intervals as follows. And let's not forget one last very important step. We're going to go ahead and round these confidence intervals by selecting them like so. And then going to the ribbon up top, clicking on home, takes us to where it says number. Right below that, we're going to go ahead and decrease the decimal places until we reach the nearest whole number, like so.